to the second Transcribers Users Workshop. Okay, I'll start again. Uh, my name is Melissa Terrace, I'm a Professor of Digital and Cultural Heritage at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm delighted to have been part of the REIT project over the past eight years as we have developed the tools and techniques for automated handwriting recognition and the Transcribers platform. So this is the second meeting of the users of the Transcribers platform. We're now at over 17,000 registered users of the site. Um, this is a really a fascinating cohort and a wonderful cohort. When we said that this meeting was happening, it sold out within two days. So people who are here, thank you for signing up quickly. But it shows the hunger and the interest that there is in now using our digitized content in a way where we can get access to the writing. So what we're going to do first off is we have a couple of opening papers. We have a paper from Gunter, the leader of the project, who's going to talk about highlights of over the past year and what's been happening with the Read project and what's been happening with Transcribers. And then we're going to talk about the Read Co-op, so that's the financial model and the community model where we're going to work towards working together once the grant finishes. Um, and then we'll probably have time for some questions for all of us too. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Peter to come up to talk about Read and Transcribers, Highlights of 2018 and Future Outlook. Thank you. I realise that some people are here who never heard anything actually directly from Tomatoes and Read, so I repeat maybe just three sentences that um, um, Read is an EU project which started in 2016 and here you see the list of partners as you see a number of universities and archives from all over Europe and we got uh, quite a lot of money, um, 8 million euro which was spent about 60% for research, so actual computer science research um, about 20% went into the Transcribers platform and about 20% into uh, dissemination and, and network building. Yeah, our goal from the very beginning was to set up a research infrastructure which shall cover the whole workflow from digitization to getting enriched text and being able to search a collection. So we, we really wanted to cover the whole workflow and our ambition was that that you get the chance to do all steps without, within the platform uh, without the need to um, use other tools. And one important objective was to set up a culture of cooperation. And this means for me that I believe that this technology, which is uh, amazing, and uh, as you may know, I'm not a computer scientist, I studied actually literature, German literature, I'm working since 20 years in this domain of uh, digitization and so on. I feel like a translator between um, technology and human humanities. Um, but this technology really will uh, change everything. And, and uh, I know that our claim that we will revolutionize access to historical documents is could be misunderstood as a simple marketing uh, claim. On the other hand, it is really my, my uh, I'm really convinced that, that this is happening. And it's not only happening because we are doing something, but uh, because so many people are doing something and because um, yeah, the whole uh, development goes in this direction. Uh, but to, become it, to make it a real success, I believe that uh, we need to cooperate across the different sectors. And there are different sectors with different interests on uh, historical documents. So researchers, many of these people have a different interest compared to archives and libraries and uh, private persons looking for their family history have a different interest. And of course, computer scientists also have uh, a different interest. But we can meet in the middle or we can meet with the platform, and that's, um, that was really the, the idea um, more or less six years ago after the kickoff meeting in, in Valencia. Um, we said, okay, that's, that's our mission and that's where we want to go. 
Yeah, uh, Melissa already mentioned it. Uh, it's really great to see that we doubled our user, uh, our registered users more or less every year. So from a bit more than 2000 in 2015, we expect that uh, this year 17,000 people will be registered in the platform. And um, it's really amazing how many people are approaching us and how many really, really interesting projects uh, um, considered or tested or maybe in preparation and so on. So uh, the, the idea that uh, text recognition is really at the heart of um, many people is, um, um, seems to be uh, a valid idea. I have summarized just for this September some of the activities in the platform to give you um, an idea of what happened just uh, a month ago. And you can see that uh, usually about 170 people, currently more because uh, we were on the news, uh, are registering per week. These about 400, 450 people are actually active users per week, so are really working with the expert client and they run more than 1,000 layout analysis jobs and about uh, six, 700 uh, handwritten text recognition jobs. What is also interesting is that uh, about uh, 100,000 or 92,000 images were uploaded by users just in September, so about 20, 25,000 images uh, per week. And uh, this is independent of any large project, so it's really what, what uh, users are doing with the expert client and pressing the button and uploading and uh, working with the, the files. But uh, what is even more interesting is that some of you know that they have the permission to train models, so we didn't make this really available this feature because of course we, we do not want to overstress our servers and the training is of course uh, something which um, requires a lot of computing power. So um, but if people are approaching us and writing an email that they want to train their own models, we give the permission. And uh, you can see that in September uh, more than 140 HDR models were trained by users within 70 collections, so typically two uh, models in the collection and with, uh, I think, about 24 different languages. So we see that people are working really with, uh, <coughs> with old languages, with uh, Arabic, with Hebrew, with, um, of course, all European languages, and very much with very peculiar and special uh, scripts, uh, like uh, there were also people from Heidelberg, I think, working with Spangler, and so on. And it seems to work, so of course not every model makes sense, but uh, a lot of them uh, make sense. And this uh, leads me to one of the, also one of the main key points in the project, that, um, that the data are really the most important <coughs> thing from my point of view. I mean, of course we are all happy with the software and what is happening there, but uh, software and algorithms will change. So today you will hear that uh, we have now the third generation of uh, HDR processing in Transcribus and uh, the, the progress is great but uh, what really remains from my point of view is of course the data and the knowledge of course uh, how to process this data. But, um, but uh, the data are as we all know and as we can read it every day in the newspaper uh, that um, the new internet uh, economy is very much based on data. And uh, I think it is one of our main, again, missions or objectives that you are the owner and you uh, remain the owner of your data. And uh, we are those who, who um, will support you to do most out of your data, but it is it is still your data and we want to have here a kind of transparency uh, which is maybe uh, not completely always the case with uh, other internet companies or whatever. 
So the ground host data, your transcriptions, and but of course other things are highly valuable. And this really surprised me that um, the models which were trained in September were based on 6,525 pages of ground truth. So uh, as you know, to create one page of ground truth is of course some work, so uh, one hour is maybe a good estimation. So people worked just for September 3.8 years on ground truth data. And I think that's something which shows the, the value if you just uh, multiply it with 20 euro, uh, you come to 130,000 euro. And uh, so there is really value generated in the platform, and uh, that uh, I think goes on more or less every month, and uh, hopefully they will increase. We have uh, concluded a number of uh, MOUs, so memorandum uh, of understandings with uh, more than 70 uh, institutions all over the world. So also here we uh, see a lot of interest. And of course we want to transform this into uh, what, what we now uh, uh, follow my talk here. Uh, this is what is the future and, and I will quickly talk about that uh, in some minutes. So in some way I believe we have achieved after these three years our mission, uh, which was to, to make the whole process uh, available to non-technical users and to allow you to yeah, carry out the whole workflow. i just give you some quick uh, images to remind you what can be done. So um, we are currently producing a first series of the scan tank, so digitization made easy with the smartphone. A lot of progress was achieved. Uh, not only with the tent, but uh, especially also with the DocScan app. So it's uh, really working very well now, and there's a number of uh, features which are very useful to scan documents, the top tab, and so on. Then I already um, mentioned the layout analysis. So this is an image I got, a typical image I got from a user uh, two weeks ago. As you can see, this is a contract from Austria and, and digitized with a uh, camera and I think a year ago there was no chance to process that kind of document and now you just press the button and you see that uh, every line was recognized uh, perfectly and uh, yes of course uh, at the binding you will have troubles to recognize but everyone will understand but uh, in principle it will work nicely with the text recognition. But it also works with tables like this and finds the, the lines and so on. Then, uh, yeah, transcription, that's something uh, you know and there was not much progress in this, of course. But uh, this is an interface which uh, is not known to all of you. It is the training interface and it is really a simple tool to select pages which were transcribed and to start the training process. So it's, uh, that's actually the easiest part. In the, whole, in the whole process and, and of course also the funniest part because uh, what you get is a kind of um, learning curve so it's a visualization of what uh, the computer does and, uh, and of course you get the figures uh, how good the model is and uh, one of the pro one progress was this year that uh, with the new version you can also do some advanced error rate measuring and you get not only more figures, which is not always useful <laughs> because uh, you need to understand what is the difference between the figures. But um, before it was much easier, just with the character array. But anyway, it also enables you to export the data and to get an understanding of uh, if you have more pages, then, then you can get a better overview and work in a more systematic way. The, this year, I have to say that um, the highlight, or one of the highlights, will be the improved uh, recognition. So, um, Umram will talk uh, afterwards uh, about HDR Plus, and uh, it's uh, now. So, some of you already know it from personal contacts with us that this new HDR is coming, and uh, we uh, in Innsbruck uh, we are able to. Install it, it is now running, the training process is running on a GPU server, 
So this goes uh, rather fast. And the results are really amazing. You will see the figures afterwards, but I just can tell you uh, it is similar to last year's uh, baseline detection. It is really a major, major progress. So this is one example of a text from the 18th century German text. And uh, you can see there are some bad words, but if you look, have a closer look, you will see that uh, often it is just one character and the character error rate for this page each is below 5%, which means that even people who are not able to read this text are able to understand more or less what is written here. The same uh, works also for printed text. You can see here that it goes down to really amazing results, just trained on 100 pages. Then I already mentioned that um, the Web interface is coming, so this is a quick preview on a simplified transcription interface in the web, which is working very nicely. And we will hear a talk uh, from the Netherlands, from the City Archive Amsterdam. They will put it online for crowd users, so this will be really one of the tests for this interface. I'm sure that, that they will like it and it will work very nicely. Yeah, then. Uh, what uh, was um, implemented last year also was uh, this keyword spotting feature. That's something some of you maybe tried out. Uh, also, I have to say that not too many people are actually using it. I will talk about this in the afternoon a bit more, but it enables you really to find words uh, which are badly transcribed. And of course, exporting is possible as well. One uh, progress was here that uh, you can come with your own XSL a T transformation and uh, get your own uh, export. Now, some words on the future of transcribos. Mm, we were this year talking a lot about the governance model. <laughs> and I have to say that four years ago, when I was uh, writing the proposal for READ, or we were writing the proposal for READ together, but uh, this section was on my part, of course. I thought, okay, I have to write something about the sustainability of uh, this research infrastructure. And I wasn't happy to write that we would found a spin-off as a company, but an um, association, it's hard to earn money with an association. A foundation is, of course, sometimes a solution. There are a number of European initiatives which uh, like uh, Europeana, which is organized as a foundation. What were the criteria for our governance model? So I thought it should be something that cooperation is at the heart. And remember the culture of cooperation, collaboration, that's something we wanted to achieve. Then um, I wanted to have an open model so that people can join and uh, institutions can join and that we get a kind of uh, group, uh, a group feeling um, that we have synergies, that we can uh, handle our forces. Then uh, it should be able to, uh, to allow archives libraries but also scholars, volunteers and uh, so on to work together. And of course also to, to be able to make some profit. Uh, but the profit should not be for the shareholders, but it should be for the stakeholders, so you here in the room. And uh, the idea was then to set up something with a cooperative society. And uh, fortunately we found out that uh, there is a, a EU regulation which gives us a good chance. And afterwards we will hear more about this from Professor Dellinger here in Vienna, who is an expert on that. Okay, this is the governance model, but of course we need also a business model to keep the sustainable, to, to, to run transcribus, to extend it, and, and so on. So what are the sources of income? This was another, another thinking, which we did in the last month. And uh, of course everything is under discussion, and uh, this conference is also very much um, dedicated to get feedback from you and uh, be frank and open, we also are 
I think uh, putting the things on the table and, and I'm happy for your feedback. So, um, of course, we would like to have a freemium model where the services are free for single users and, uh, and so that the barriers are low to test and, and run some processes on the Transcripts platform, so we want to be open here. But on the other hand, if it comes to professional use, if uh, a specific amount of data is uh, reached, then uh, some processing fees probably will appear. Of course, the amount uh, has to be discussed and, and uh, has to be, yeah. I, I wouldn't like to say some figures now, but uh, we are open for discussions. Then, uh, of course, some institutions are approaching us for a specific projects, so customer projects, large scale projects, where more work is done for a specific customer and we have done now tests with the high performance cluster in Innsbruck and uh, it is, we can say that we can easily process 200,000 pages a day or even more so uh, the, the sources are here and, and the opportunities are here to really work. Of course we are happy and this is something which is in an academic environment very usual that we are part of uh, grant applications so of course we are looking also from our side for grant applications, but we are also happy to be part of your grant application. And actually a lot of people are approaching us for this. Yeah, so that's something I, I believe uh, is, is of course interesting for us. And we will sell this content. Toxcan will, will remain free, but uh, we will sell this content and hope that uh, it will be something which is useful for a number of people. So these are some ideas on how we would like to generate money for the Transcribus platform or for Vito if it becomes the uh, definite governance model. So 2019 and beyond, um, of course we want to found the Vito group together with you. We are already involved in the new side project, so this is an EU project uh, dealing with newspaper digitization and newspaper enrichment. Again, the colleagues from Rostock are there as well and uh, we will have the pleasure to benefit from their work uh, somehow as well. So, uh, article recognition and layout analysis for printed uh, documents, especially newspapers, uh, will be something which will be available via Transcribus in 2019-2020. Then, we are very happy that we get the first project with the National Archive of Finland. So the Ministry decided that they want to give Transcribus a try and we will set up the first large scale, or large scale, but uh, at least the first project with 800,000 pages of court records uh, and make them available with keyword spotting. So train the models, uh, run the models and set up a specific site for this. And a message which I got just two days ago that we also get funding from the Tyrolean government, so a local call. But the nice thing is that we were already able to uh, convince them that the Vitco is uh, the official partner in foundation, he said. And uh, there we will set up a project with cadastral documents. And uh, we are currently in negotiations with a number of institutions in the Netherlands, in Ireland, in Canada and the US and some other countries also for setting up larger projects. So I see actually um, a, a good chance to make a successful transition from the project to an ongoing uh, service. But of course it is a challenge, it is also new for us and uh, We'll see, but uh, yeah, I think we have some good opportunities. So thank you a lot for this. Thanks for that, Gunter. We'll go straight on to the next presentation, which is about more about the Read Co-op, and then we'll have time for a couple of questions before coffee, hopefully. So I'd now like to introduce Marcus Deliger. I'm sorry, from Austria. From the Austrian Reifweisenverband, <laughs> <laughs> Reifweisen Association, 
it's, it's the umbrella organization of Raiffeisen Austria, as you can see. Thank you, sorry, I should have practiced that before I came up with my <laughs> Well, yes, good morning, everybody. I'm Marcus Dellinger, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, and I'm uh, grateful to, to have the opportunity to learn something about a uh, totally different world. I, uh, I think I'm coming a little bit from another world, uh, as you can judge by the tie. I'm the only one on our that has spotted another <laughs> guy. <laughs> but, uh, well, it's a different world, it's the legal world, uh, but uh, uh, maybe it's of some service for you. Well, my career started also at the university, uh, so it's, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, university procedures. I've worked there for 15 years and I became an expert in cooperatives uh, and edited this book, for example, uh, about Austrian uh, cooperatives, so it, it would be much easier for me to found an Austrian cooperative. Very easy, very much of experience, but you are intending to do something new. Uh, the first SCE uh, building or foundation in Austria, which uh, uh, is quite an interesting project also for me. Uh, I'm now working almost 16 years at the Austrian Raiffeisen Association, which is, as I uh, have mentioned before, an umbrella organization for the whole Raiffeisen group uh, in Austria. Uh, there are many banks, but also uh, other institutions uh, in the agricultural field of, of business. Uh, and the Austrian Raiffeisen Federation uh, provides audit services for all the members. This is important, this will also uh, fit and apply to an SCE, becoming member of the Austrian Raiffeisen Association, the audit services. Uh, we also do uh, education, training, uh, and we give, for example, legal advice. That's my uh, duty, uh, as you can guess. Uh, well, uh, let's start with the agenda. We have plenty to do in the upcoming 30 minutes. I want to give you a short overview of what are the legal characteristics uh, of cooperatives. Uh, then the second part will be why is an SCE the proper legal form for what you are intending to do. Uh, and the third part will be a short overview uh, over the draft statutes of the REIT Co-op, uh, which have been prepared in the last months. Well, uh, so let's start with the legal characteristics of the uh, cooperative. Uh, I found a definition of uh, cooperatives prepared by the uh, International Cooperative Alliance, and they say a cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. And this definition is fitting pretty well. It's just what a cooperative is. Uh, we will have a closer look to that. The first part is that it is all about meeting your own needs, meeting the common economic, social and cultural needs. So you can see that a cooperative basically is a self-help organization. A cooperative always interferes, makes business with their own members, its own members. It's normal uh, to have related parties transactions. Uh, it's in, for, for a limited liability company or a joint stock company, it's always dangerous uh, to have related parties transactions. They are own shareholders. Huh? You, you have uh, restrictions. It's always necessary to deal at arm's length, huh? to treat their own shareholders as if they were foreigners. Dealing at arm's length. This is not the case 
in a cooperative. A cooperative is built for doing business to, to make, uh, well, uh, yeah, business with their own members and to provide services uh, for them uh, and uh, to create member wealth. And this creation of member value uh, should be a direct creation of member value. It's not that we make profit in a cooperative and then we pay dividends to the shareholders. But we create the member value directly by making something that the members need. Meeting the needs of the members. That's the purpose of a cooperative. Immediate creation of, well, value for the members. And the second characteristic, which is very important uh, for cooperatives, is the open membership. Uh, it was mentioned before uh, by Dr. Mühlberger that uh, you have a high interest in uh, being open for the access of everybody interested uh, in the Transcribus platform. So I think that really a cooperative is the adequate legal form for you because it's much easier to become member of a cooperative than uh, to have access to a limited liability company. Uh, accessing a limited liability company uh, would create a need to change the statutes. If it goes along with an increase of the share capital. And this is a rather complicated procedure. In a cooperative, you just apply for membership uh, and the board of directors says, okay, yes, come in. It's very easy. Uh, and uh, it uh, goes along with a variable capital. Uh, you just pay in more shares, so the share capital rises. Uh, and then uh, if, if somebody wants to leave, it's also possible. You just leave, you get your shares back uh, after six months. It's the minimum period uh, allowed from, from the law. Uh, you get your money back uh, and you leave the cooperative uh, if you say, okay, you have promoted me enough. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's enough uh, from that side. So the capital of a cooperative is always variable and uh, this is the reason for a very simple approach to uh, membership transactions. In capital companies, in limited liability companies or joint stock companies, uh, the transactions uh, are always at the uh, market value. Uh, it's always very difficult to find out what is the enterprise and what is the worth, the value of the enterprise. Uh, you have to uh, expend lots of money for experts telling you, okay, what's the value, you know, the market value. Uh, and in a cooperative, uh, you do all this stuff very easily uh, because you do it at nominal value. It's, uh, in our draft, uh, it's 250 euro, one share, you pay in, 250 euros, uh, and if you leave, you get out 250 euros. Uh, uh, quite simple. Uh, well, uh, connected with that one is that uh, you can't have a purpose uh, to uh, have any, any profits or to make money by an increase of share prices. Uh, there is no increase. Uh, shares are always 250 euros uh, that remains the same uh, throughout the history uh, of the cooperative unless you, you change the uh, nominal value by uh, amendment to your statutes. Okay, then the next point was the autonomy and the democratic control. Well, 
we always speak of self-administration in cooperatives. And this feature of self-administration uh, comes out in the people, the members uh, themselves, uh, are the only ones being able to be elected in the board of directors. So you have to be a member of the cooperative uh, to become a board member in the cooperative. The people themselves, the members themselves, administrate their cooperative. And the uh, decisions in the General Assembly follow the democratic principle. Uh, in, in former times we had one man, one vote uh, as a slogan. Uh, in, in the democracy uh, field, also in, in national politics, and it's the same in cooperatives. Normal, the, the strict model is one member, one vote, regardless of how many shares you have. Uh, for the SCE, this strict concept uh, is softened somehow. It's, it's uh, not so strict in an SCE, you can have up to five votes uh, for the bigger members. Uh, but everybody counts. Also, the normal, natural person becoming a member, he or she also has got one vote. So this is similar to our democracy. Uh, you, we don't have more votes uh, in public elections because we are paying more taxes uh, or some of us are paying more taxes. Well, this uh, has been abolished uh, I think in the 1910s, something like that. Uh, the origins were uh, also in, in our national politics like that. Okay, so this is our uh, democratic control, mm -hmm. democratic way of decision making in the General Assembly of the Court. Well, the SCE regulation is, as a regulation, directly applicable. It's European law directly applicable. And it is more or less the common essence of European cooperative laws. I had the opportunity to join the negotiations over the SCE regulation some 16 years uh, ago. Or Oh, I think the, the negotiations uh, finished then, and it was uh, really an amazing process with uh, people from all over Europe uh, fighting and arguing why their cooperative law is the best one and we should uh, keep their own ideas. Uh, and uh, this is a European compromise. It's the essence of all the cooperative laws of you. And so, as I've seen in the first uh, report from, from Dr. Mühlberger, you are coming from all over Europe, so it will be really adequate uh, to have uh, such kind of European compromise as your uh, basic legal form. Best of European co cooperative laws uh, in the SCE regulation. For example, uh, you have the the chance to select whether you want to have a dualistic system with a managing board and a supervisory board as we are used to in Austria and Germany or you can have the uh, one tier system, the monistic system with one board of directors, one administrative board uh, as a whole doing uh, the managing and the supervision uh, all in one. The registered office of uh, your cooperative, if you decide to have one, would be, as I've learned, uh, in Austria. Uh, this uh, has some importance because uh, being registered in Austria uh, means that this is an Austrian SCE. And the Austrian uh, cooperative law, the Austrian uh, well, executive laws uh, will be supplementary applicable uh, to that cooperative. <coughs> so it's the European regulation 
and supplementary also uh, Austrian law. For example, uh, this means uh, for you uh, that uh, an Austrian SCE uh, would have to apply for membership in a so-called Revisionsverband. We, the Austrian Raiffeisen Association, are such kind of Revisionsverband. Revisionsverband means we are organizing the audit for uh, all the cooperatives being our members. We have, we have auditors as our clerks and they do an independent work. Nobody can interfere with what they are doing. Uh, there is no one who says, uh, oh, down or up, <laughs> it's, it's uh, not possible. Independent audit uh, <coughs> by these uh, clerks of, of our association, uh, and they are well trained and they do more than a normal auditor does. The normal auditor in, in the uh, company world uh, only uh, checks whether everything is legal. Uh, and whether the accounting is correct and the uh, accounting principles are uh, complied with. In a cooperative, there is an additional feature. In a cooperative, the auditor also, at least in an Austrian, or would be the same in Germany, uh, in, a, in an Austrian or in German cooperative, the auditor also checks whether there is the fulfillment of the promotion purpose. And he or she would also check the expediency and the economic efficiency of the management. And this creates, or it is supposed to create, uh, some portion of extra trust uh, for all the members. Uh, if there is an economic auditing uh, for what is done in the cooperative? Uh, is, is the money used well? Uh, that's the question. Uh, is the managing men really in good shape? Are they doing well? This is a question a normal auditor wouldn't like to interfere because he wants to uh, be selected one more time. Uh, uh, don't tell the manager that he's doing rubbish. Uh, uh, well, in, in a cooperative, uh, managers sometimes uh, get this message uh, from, from the special uh, auditor. Okay, uh, then uh, we have a uh, short time, some time for, for a short look over the main contents of the draft statutes uh, that have been uh, prepared. First, the name to the Reed Corp SCE with limited liability, so nobody uh, has to be afraid that uh, there will be extra payments in case of insolvency of uh, our uh, cooperative. It's just a 250 uh, euro per share. You can lose that, obviously, if uh, the uh, cooperative should go bankrupt, uh, but uh, not anymore. Uh, and by the way, it shouldn't happen. At least Austrian cooperatives are uh, the, on the last rank of all the legal forms uh, in the statistics uh, of uh, insolvencies. Maybe also because of the strict audit. Okay, then the SCE will be set up uh, in the monistic system, as I've heard uh, in your last meeting. This was preferred by a, a felt majority. Uh, uh, and well, it is possible uh, to have this uh, monistic uh, system with just an administrative board uh, doing uh, all the management and also uh, the supervision. Then, most important, the purpose of the SCE. Well, there everybody should find his or her interests in, in, in this clause. Uh, this should be what you really want to do. The purpose of the SCE is to satisfy the needs of its members and to promote their economic, scientific and cultural activities, in particular with regard to digitization. I think it's digi or 
speaking? Or I don't know. Uh, digitization, transcription, recognition, and searching historical documents. And some other purposes follow or subject matters. The ongoing operation of the Transcribus platform, and for example, the provision and operation of the necessary technical facilities. Then I heard that you also want to make business with non-members, uh, people from outside. It should be uh, possible to use Transcribus uh, also uh, for people who are not member. Uh, and this uh, has to be stated in the statutes expressively, uh, that you want to do business also uh, outside. And if you want to be open, you have, this, you have to have this clause. Okay, the capital stock uh, of an SCE uh, has uh, to be at least 30,000 euro. It uh, is denominated in euro. And, well, as I told you before, the capital stock is variable. Uh, you don't need an amendment to the articles of association if the uh, share capital rises, for example, because new members uh, apply for membership uh, and pay in uh, their shares. So you will see uh, many changes here. In the other direction, you have a minimum uh, requirement of uh, 30,000 euro. So it may happen that some uh, members wanting to leave the cooperative uh, will have to wait for their money uh, because the uh, amount of share capital would uh, fall below this uh, threshold of uh, 30,000 euro. And this is not possible, this is not allowed, uh, falling below this threshold. So they would just have to wait uh, until new members join or old members uh, pay in more shares uh, so that it is possible uh, to pay back the, uh, the shares for them without falling below the threshold. Uh, I think there was an automatic translation uh, spread uh, in, in preparation uh, for this meeting. The, the automatic translation in this point is uh, rather misleading. Uh, so maybe uh, you understand better what is meant uh, when you read the slides. Okay, then for the shares, they will have the nominal value of 250 euros. It is intended that the amount, the number of shares an institution has to pay in differs according to the number of employees the institution has. Uh, I think you can discuss the figures. It's just an, a proposal, uh, but it's maybe a, a smart approach to, to have some uh, interference, some relation between the number of employees, the number of users of an institution, and the numbers of shares that have to be paid in. A natural person, just one share, just 250 <coughs> euro uh, to become a member. And, well, there is also a provision in the draft statutes uh, about the uh, voting rights and these voting rights uh, should also uh, relate somehow to the number of shares so that the bigger institutions uh, having had to pay in more shares will have uh, greater voting rights up to the limit of uh, five votes uh, for the biggest uh, of all. There will also be possibility to have members who are not eligible for the use of transcribus. They are just supporters of the idea of transcribus, but they are not able to use it for themselves. And in that case, we speak of investing members. It's possible to invest 
in uh, such a kind of cooperative. It's it's some kind of, of strange investment uh, because it's not it's not for making big profits. Uh? But maybe uh, you have uh, institutions, foundations. Um, maybe uh, if you if you uh, apply for grants in any way that somebody will give money to the SCE, uh, and then it will be possible for this investing member uh, also to have shares and uh, to have some voting rights. Here we would suggest to have a greater amount of shares and in the relation less voting rights. And it's also important that the whole group of investing members, if, if there will be a whole group, I don't know, uh, but the whole group of investing members uh, under no circumstances uh, can have more than 25% of the voting rights. So uh, there is no threat of uh, being governed by people who are not really interested in transcribos, but only in their money. Uh, this uh, can't happen, or should not happen, uh, in an SCE uh, cooperative. Well, then we have the place of the General Assembly will normally be at the registered office. And the registered office is planned to be in Innsbruck. So Innsbruck is a beautiful town and maybe uh, everybody wants uh, to come to Innsbruck uh, every year. Uh, but uh, if not so, uh, if, if you want, don't want to spend uh, your whole budgets by, by traveling expenses, uh, it should also be possible uh, to have an electronic participation uh, in, in a virtual uh, general assembly. Uh, and I think uh, this could be a smart idea. Well, I think for further details, just uh, join the workshop uh, following after the coffee break. Thank you, sir.